It's New Year's Eve 2022. Expectations are sky high as the countdown to midnight approaches. Streets are alive with partygoers, all decked out in their finest apparel and ready to ring in 2023 with a bang. But as people flood to clubs and champagne flows like water, one person is doing things a little differently. While everyone else is getting ready to celebrate, this person is turning his ride-sharing app to driver mode, signaling that he's ready to pick up drunk passengers. This isn't just any ordinary person either, he's a billionaire, so he clearly doesn't need the extra cash. Every year, this mysterious mogul sneaks out of his friend's fancy parties and spends New Year's Eve behind the wheel of a cab. Who is he? And what's up with this strange and kinda sketchy tradition? New Year's Eve is critical for ride-sharing companies like Uber and Lyft. It's one of the busiest nights of the year and it highlights the biggest challenge every marketplace faces, allocation efficiency. It doesn't matter if you're Lyft, Airbnb or OpenSea, nailing allocation is critical. At its core, the ride-hailing business is about matching riders who are looking for a comfortable way to get from point A to B with drivers who are looking for a flexible income stream. But getting this market equilibrium of supply and demand exactly right is harder than most people realize. Not only do you have to ensure that there are enough drivers available to meet passenger demand without oversaturating the market, you also have to get the geotemporal alignment right. Let's just call it GTA for ease. Man, I missed that game. GTA is the process of matching the availability of drivers with the demand for rides in a specific geographic location at a specific time. Why is this important? Well, at any given moment, there may be hundreds of passengers requesting rides within the same area. Think Times Square during New Year's Eve, for example. But drivers are constantly moving and may not always be close enough to fulfill a pickup request. This often leads to situations where the closest available driver is still too far away to pick up a passenger within a reasonable time frame. To manage this, both Uber and Lyft analyze a variety of data points in real time, including driver location, trip demand, and traffic patterns. The goal is to optimize the match between drivers and riders and ensure that trips are completed efficiently with minimal wait times. This includes using techniques like dynamic pricing, surge pricing, and real-time demand forecasting. While data is incredibly powerful, it can only explain so much. Some behavioral patterns need to be analyzed and observed in person. Our billionaire is driving on New Year's Eve for this very reason. It's John Simmer, the co-founder of Lyft. He's been driving for Lyft every New Year's Eve for the past 11 years. Hey, I'm John Zimmer, co-founder of Lyft. I drive with Lyft every year, at least on New Year's. Coming from a hospitality background, I care deeply about the driver community. I want to make sure I do everything I can to understand as much as possible what it's like to drive on Lyft and what their alternatives are. In the early days, many people considered ride-sharing a winner-take-all industry. Even though Lyft has been living in Uber's shadow since its founding in 2012, the company has managed to claw itself to a 30% market share, proving that ride-sharing is more of a duopoly. And Simmer is determined to find ways to improve his company's product. While most people are getting wasted with their friends on the 31st, Simmer is driving around San Francisco asking himself one critical question. How can I make Lyft's services faster, cheaper, and more efficient? A lot of this boils down to GTA. For a long time, Lyft's goal has been to provide riders with a maximum 3 minute ETA before a car will pick them up. Any additional minutes will lead to fewer people requesting a ride. The conversion rate can drop as much as 50% if the wait time is any longer than 3 minutes. And that's why I never use Lyft. I understand you feel that. This isn't about feelings, man. This is about facts. You're shedding 6.5% a, a day of potential revenue to us, post Uber X. We're gonna roll out dynamic pricing, that number's gonna double. You're gonna lose all your drivers. More than that, you're gonna lose your customers because they like your little interface, but you know what they like more? A car that shows up fast, and you won't be able to provide it. This relentless focus on specific time intervals is pretty interesting. It reminds me of Spotify and Daniel Eek's obsession with cutting any song's buffering time to less than 200 milliseconds. The human brain perceives anything that takes less than 200 milliseconds as instantaneous, and Spotify wanted every user to feel like the music started as soon as they hit play. It's fascinating to me how much focus and effort actually goes into optimizing a flawless customer experience. As consumers, we take it for granted that every song on Spotify should play immediately and that our Uber or Lyft should arrive when the app says it will. Some of what John Simmer is doing is definitely a PR stunt. I mean, look at me, I'm making a freaking video about it. But obsessing over metrics and directly interacting with our own products as entrepreneurs is important. 
Many founders do this in the early days, but it's less common to see people do it once they built a billion dollar empire. Another entrepreneur who used to do this is Tony Shea, the former CEO of Zappos who sadly passed away in 2020. Tony Shea was a true customer service king and I learned a lot studying him from afar. Despite Zappos having thousands of employees, Tony used to take customer service calls to better understand his customers' needs. He was so intense about it in fact that every single Zappos employee had to do it. It didn't matter if you were an accountant or a software engineer. Every Zappos employee had to spend two weeks on the phone taking calls from customers as part of the company's onboarding program. I remember reading this one story in Tony's book Delivering Happiness in which Tony and a group of friends were staying at a hotel after a late night out. They tried to order a pepperoni pizza from the hotel's room service but were disappointed to learn that the kitchen had already closed at 11pm. In their drunken state, Tony convinced a friend to call Zappos customer service and ask if they could help with the situation. This obviously didn't make any sense. Zappos sells online shoes, not food, but Tony insisted that the friend should call Zappos anyway to see what happens. The Zappos rep on the other end of the line was initially confused by the request, but she quickly recovered and provided the group with a list of the five closest places in the area that were still open and delivering pizzas. The representative's actions left a lasting impression on Tony's friend who became a loyal customer. Which I think the friend should have been anyway, friends should always support each other's businesses, but that's, that's besides the point. I love this story because it illustrates how founders and CEOs can empower employees to do what's best for the brand, even in really weird situations, simply by leading by example, whether that's driving for Lyft on New Year's Eve or taking regular customer service calls at Zappos. 2022 was a wild year for business and I appreciate you for hanging with me during all the carnage. If you want a recap of all the crazy business stories from 2022, not really sure why you would, it was a pretty painful year, but if you do and want to hear my key takeaways and what I learned from them, watch this video next. It's an important year for us to remember after all. Thanks a lot and see you next time.